Okay, so welcome to the BPRO Prospective Open Seminar at the Bartlett School of Architecture UCL. Um, the series of open seminar aims to invite diverse range of thinkers and practitioners around the world. And today you've joined the second edition, which will support the development of our journal, Issue 3, that will be published by the end of July. So you can revisit our last seminar on the Bartlett's uh, female channel. So hi, my name is Provides, uh, currently lecturer at the Bartlett. This session will be recorded and we encourage you to submit a question for the speakers at any point during the lecture by clicking on the chat box or the Q&A function. So the format for today is that first we'll hear a 20 minute presentation from each guest and then we'll begin a round table discussion in the second half. So the total session should last at 2.5 hours. And before I introduce our curators, here are two big announcements for uh, perspectives. The first one is that issue two will be published this Friday so we would like to give thanks to all who have contributed to the journal. And the second issue has the theme algorithmic uh, form, which is curated by Alejandro Bava with a very exciting lineup of authors, including Mario Carpel, Hans Ulrich Obrist, uh, Roberto Botazzi, Philip Morel, and more. So of course, uh, we also have amazing contributions from the open call. And if you missed the last open call, don't worry about it because we are putting out another one for issue three. Uh, so Welcome to visit our website for more information. And this is also the second announcement is that um, we're currently inviting paper submission from students and uh, scholars, designers and researchers on the topic of climate friction, bracket R. Uh, you can find out more details on the Instagram page of the journal. And I will also put a link on a chat box later. So now let me introduce our curators for the third issue of Perspectives. Um, our fairy Deborah and Haddon, um, who are architects and founders of Pirate, but also uh, lecturers at the School of Architecture, uh, Bartlett. They have this interdisciplinary design and research studio and their work adopt approaches from various fields and contexts, addressing topics related to climate, uh, ecology, human perception, machine sentience, and their capacity for altering current models of existence through eminent fictions. Their work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale, the Seoul Biennale, and Japanese Junction, and they have published uh, articles at various conferences such as Acadia, Tagnet, and COCA. There are currently both lecturers at the Bartlett in the BPO program where they run Research Cluster 1 in Architectural Design and Mark. And the research cluster is titled Monumental Wasteland, which focuses on climate migration and autonomous ecologies using methods of decoding and recording through um, climate fiction. They have uh, recently published their own magazine, so please support them. And without further delay, I'm handing over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Provides, for the intro. Um, thanks, Molly, for the invitation. And of course, thanks to BPO for hosting the event. Uh, thanks to all the guests who have joined us. Really excited to have you all here. Um, and thanks for the audience as well. So. Uh, maybe just to quickly introduce the context of the seminar on climate frictions. Um, this was sort of the prompt or the blurb um, that we kind of put out, which was uh, the effects of climate change have become increasingly legible with implications across multiple geographical uh, scales and regions. Read as ecological and environmental transformations, accelerated transitional states are unfolding consequences and prompting responses within social, political, economic, human and non-human spheres alike. So for instance, the term climate migration was coined by an Alaskan human rights lawyer in 2008 to describe the permanent forced relocation of communities due to climate change. And that same year, Ecuador introduced articles 10 and 71 to 74 to their constitution that explained the rights of nature as both a definition and the means to its legal and practical application. So this seminar has invited guest speakers whose research and work can be read as forming a constellation for how we might approach designing at various scales through various mediums in our current climatic regime. Some of the questions that we put forward here, are, can technologies be designed and utilized without falling into territorializing troops? Can AI be used to challenge current production-based economies? What are the ways of subverting existing power structures or what decisions will nature make if it, if it could govern itself? What kinds of technologies, protocols, and policies can afford such as autonomy? And how will this affect, uh, how will this affect architectural production, design, and habitation at individual, urban, and larger ecological scales? So with that in mind, um, we will quickly introduce our guests uh, in order of their presentations. 
Um, and then after that, it'll move on to their presentations. And after that, we'll have the round table. Uh, so first um, presenting will be Dr. Bradley Cantrell and Marantha Dawkins. So Bradley is chair and professor of landscape architecture at the University of Virginia. As a landscape architect and scholar, his work focuses on the role of computation and media in environmental and ecological design. His work in Louisiana over the past decade points to a series of methodologies that develop modes of modeling, simulation, and embedded computation that express and engage complexity of overlapping physical, cultural, and economic systems. Marantha is a landscape architect and scholar whose work is interested in wet ecologies at the end of the world. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Virginia um, School of Architecture, specializing in urban resilience through lenses of ecology, hydrology, computation, and infrastructure. Catherine Griffiths is a media artist, designer, and researcher exploring critical code and algorithmic aesthetics in the context of machine learning ethics. As an Annenberg Fellow, she's a PhD candidate and in interdisciplinary media arts at USC School of Cinematic Arts. She's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan with a joint appointment between Tuchman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and the Digital Studies Institute and runs her own design practice called ISOHEL. By creating simulations, short films, and software applications, her hybrid practice theory based Creative research attempts to make palpable invisible computational forces that shape power and social dynamics. Um, Andrew Witt is an associate professor in practice in architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, teaching and researching on the relationship of geometry and machines to perception, design, construction, and culture. Trained as both an architect and mathematician, he has a particular interest in a technically synthetic and logically rigorous approach to form. Witt is also a co-founder with Tobias Nolte of Certain Measures, a Boston Berlin based design and technology studio that combines imagination and evidence for systemic and scalable approaches to spatial problems. He is the author of a recently published book, Formulations, Architecture, Mathematics, Culture, an expansive examination of the visual, methodological and pessimistic connections between design, mathematics and the broader sciences. Dr. Theo Dunas is a registered and chartered architect and the learning excellence leader at the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture and Built Environment at RGU, where he directs the MSc in Advanced Architectural Design and orchestrates the school's effort in digitization. His research expertise encompasses blockchain, generative and parametric systems with a tight orchestration between design and fabrication. He's currently directing WWW Archchain that CC a project that seeks to establish a decentralized building information modeling tool set and mechanisms for the AEC industry. Additionally, he conducts research in design for fabrication and assembly through a series of projects in robotic fabrication of timber components for building. And Damian Jovanovic is an architect, educator, and software designer based in Los Angeles. He currently works as full-time faculty at SciArc. Damian's work centers on the development of experimental architectural software, and his interests lie in investigating the culture and aesthetics of software platforms, as well as questions of contemporary architectural education, authorship, and creativity. He is the co-founder of Lifeforms.io, an experimental transdisciplinary design studio based in LA that makes virtual worlds and experiences using real-time technologies. And perhaps lastly, um, we have Dr. Andrew Toland, who won't be presenting with us today. Um, he's Sydney-based, and <laughs> which kind of explains the, the time uh, difference issue. Uh, but uh, he will be submitting a written contribution, and he is a transdisciplinary scholar of the natural and built environment. His research is focused on the capacity of landscape architecture to change how we view, understand, and change our environmental realities. So um, without further ado, sorry for the extremely lengthy uh, <laughs> introduction, but um, feels proper. We're very excited to have each of you here. And thanks again for joining us from all around. And uh, we would like to hand it over to Bradley and Marantha. Um, please feel free to screen share. And yes. Okay. Um... Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm Marantha, uh, joined by Brad out here. And our talk is 
titled Wild Disequilibria, Climatic Energy and Ecological Autonomy. There's no way back to previous climatic regimes. Accepting this presents an opportunity to reframe considerations of risk and indeterminacy as questions of restructuring and rewilding. Shifting the discussion of global warming from a matter of scarcity of resources to an abundance of energy that can kickstart landscape futures. Earth systems are moving hundreds to thousands of times faster than they did when we first documented them. This acceleration is distributed across such vast space and time scales that the consequences are ubiquitous, but also unthinkable, which sets present day Earth out of reach of existing cognitive tools, right? So the world goes from legible to illegible very quickly. From succession to extinction, to ocean biochemistry, to ice migration, our understanding of environmental norms has expired. This is underlined by the state of climate adaptation today, which is filled with moving targets and brittle infrastructures, increasing rates of failure and overly complicated management regimes. These symptoms illustrate how much trouble contemporary adaptation has escaping the cognitive dissonance of the way in which knowledge about climate is produced. So we're at, a, we're at a time when the information has eclipsed its own ideological boundaries. And this eclipse represents a crisis of knowledge, but one that we are going to discuss here as um, being able to give rise to a new climatic form. Changing how we think and how we see climatic energy can help us make contact with the underlying texture and, and character of this wild new time we find ourselves in. Um, I mean, traditional, traditional climate thinking, especially with the aid of computation, has achieved so much. Right? Everything we know about the world's climate, past, present, future, we know through models. Where weather can be experienced, our understanding of climate relies on weather data um, collected over long periods of, of time and assembled into patterns. And so this way of understanding climate has advanced extremely quickly over the past few decades, enough that we can get really high resolution pictures like this one, which illustrates how water temperature swirls around the earth. So climate models use grids to organize their high resolution layered data and, and then give it rules about how to pass information to neighboring cells. But the infinite storage capacity of these grid cells and the way that they're set up to handle rules and parameters creates a really vicious cycle by enabling exponential growth toward greater and greater degrees of accuracy. So models end up getting bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier with more and more data operating under the assumption that collecting enough information will eventually lead to the uh, establishment of a perfect control earth and to uh, an earth that is under perfect control. But this clearly isn't the case uh, because for these models, more data means more uncertainty about the future, right? And this is the central issue with the traditional bottom-up climate knowledge. It, it continues to pursue precision. So we get a more and more perfect description of the past but the future gets more and more obscene and unthinkable. So in other words, like in a, in a non-linear world, to look through the lens of these bottom-up models turns the future into an aberration. In contrast, to look from the top down and to develop theory and methods from the outside, you know, rather than trying to break apart and control climatic phenomena from the inside, allows for a more emancipatory, naive, and generative climatic understanding. From the top down, it's easier to be attentive to the materiality and the forms, the intelligence, and the ultimate autonomy of underlying climatic disequilibria. So eddies swirling around the earth can take on this kind of medieval primordial shape and diagrams of phenomena like the Gulf Stream 
start to shimmer with a kind of vitality and an energy and a wildness. Can you still see my screen? Did that did that go away? We can see it. Okay. Uh, thanks. Sorry, it just like all went away for a second. Um. So what makes these energetic things tick? How do they move? Um, what weighs them down? Or what works them up? Uh, paying attention to the way that the Gulf Stream snakes around, for example, prompts questions about speed, like the speed at which the current distributes heat around the world and what it would take to slow that speed down. And so here we see that it would take the weight of Mars to slow the Earth down enough to save polar ice. Right, it, it, it would add four hours to the day. Um, and the, this huge, somewhat arbitrary and unrealistic exercise starts to illustrate how an engagement with the climate from the top down, again, breaks apart the contemporary intangibility of climate, right? Asking questions about what things do rather than how they, how they work opens up the potential for a climate design that can actually like approach meaningfulness, hopefully. Um, here, the coldness and the freshness of letting the water from the Mississippi River flow freely into the Gulf of Mexico, um, flow freely rather than damming it up, creates an extreme density difference, which would have the potential to dramatically decrease hurricane power and, and hurricanes uh, cause immense damage in the equatorial region here. You can see all the tracks um, in this image. So this tells us that here, altering settlement patterns, like changing the way that we live along rivers, can change the weather, can change weather for a huge swath of the earth. And, and it tells us that design can, can start to unlock the energy in this system to set, up, to set a new climatic regime into motion. Um, there's, a, there's a tension between I think between a kind of humility about how, how, how small humans are and the lunacy of imagining that we can engineer dramatic and effective climate fixes using only politics and abstract principles, right? In both of these cases, climate is framed as being about control, control of a narrative or control of an environment. But thinking energetically in this way, using dis disequilibrium as a starting point, can place us in a fundamentally different position that's not about control, but rather about designing autonomy. Excellent, thank you, Maranta. So I'm, going, I'm going to speak quickly about a, um, a, a case kind of within this kind of concept of dis, um, disequilibria. Um, and, 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 it's, and this comes from a, a previous uh, bit of work that um, I've been discussing with Marantha, but also originally originated with um, uh, ecologist Earl Ellis and landscape historian, um, uh, environmental historian, Laura Jane Martin. So as we speculate on our, on, on our indeterminate futures, humanity is confronted with the notion that our regimes of control are at the detriment of other species, both flora and fauna. The narrow band of life vital for and constructed by humans threatens the ecological fitness of entire regions. Captured water systems, armored coastlines, industrial waste, resource extraction, and even the banal life of highly manicured landscapes are all products of human priorities that reduce the agency of other species. So for design, the creation of wildness is an unfamiliar and problematic task that asks for the evidence of human creativity and work to be deprioritized within an ecological system. We would ask, is it possible to counteract, negate, or erase human influences? And to what degree is this, um, is this uh, worth the effort? Um, and what, did, what does it even mean to begin to paint ourselves out of the picture? Also, uh, more importantly in this, what is the space for designing wildness? Is it possible that by blackboxing the curation of phenomena using technological maintenance as a form of intimacy and care, we may find space to produce habitable wildness? What will happen to the interconnections between humanity and other species when they are beyond our control and also perceived to be beyond our understanding? The idea of creating wildness is not new. 
uh, in the 1920s, for example, American um, ecologists developed the idea of creative conservation. Um, Hershberger concluded that ecologists may reproduce nature so closely by the use of native plants that our fellow uh, fellow men are, de are deceived and believe that they look upon a wild growth when in fact it is artificial. Uh, a, few, a few years later, ecologist Edith Roberts, working with landscape architect Elsa Raymond, described how to garden in order to leave the woods absolutely natural and seemingly untouched. Um, and this, this kind of history of, of the um, uh, kind of idealization of wildness and the recreation of it is, goes back even farther than that in um, uh, Europe and Asia. Indeed, for nearly a century, landscape architects and restoration ecologists in North America have sought to intervene in landscapes in such a way that it mimics wild nature or facilitates its autonomous recovery. Wildness itself is an unusual design challenge. It's fraught with contradictions that are technical and formal, as well as cultural and philosophical. The design of wild places has not usually aimed to preserve the historical character of regions rather than being generative. It, it's typically establishing the picturesque and um, to curate human experiences harking back to a period before modernism. Yet to design is inherently a human act, an influence in itself. To, to design a space free of human influence therefore requires uh, some sort of distanced authorship, which would favor process, agency, curation, and choreography. Um, and design from a distance would, would need to allow ecological systems and wild populations to co-evolve through their sustained interactions, sustained by an infrastructure operating beyond human control or interference uh, that would continuously promote non-human autonomy and counter um, human influence. So the fiction um, of a wildness creator represents some sort of non-human intelligent actor, initially developed by human designers, but enabled to learn its own novel strategic behaviors through sustained environmental er interactions in creating and maintaining an ecosystem free of, of anthropogenic influence. These would be possibly with algorithms that control the behavior of the system um, and are learned from its context and operations um, rather than uh, pre-programmed uh, for human goals. It may have a range of um, operating principles. Um, operation, the operations and activities of a system of an infrastructure like this would be invisible and inscrutable to human observers. Uh, the processes that govern the system are independently learned, hidden from, and functionally unknowable to human beings. Um, humans visiting uh, these created wild places would be able to enter fully, be able to experience a space with an ecology appearing to be operated entirely without any influence of human beings. Um, the wildness creator uh, is, would be constantly monitoring for human influence and removing it, uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, canceling anthropogenic noise, blocking um, uh, light, um, and, and removing human artifacts and pollutants. Um, the wildness creator would, uh, would promote the autonomy of non-human species and ecological processes to sustain diverse and wild populations without our intervention. Um, many of these things, like these, these um, operating principles, I think you can probably see them coming from other, um, the way we might think through other disciplines, through conservation, even through forms of um, landscape design. So as an example, um, a, a wildness creator, this autonomous um, system might be deployed and then begin operating across the site of a coastal wetland brownfield. The system would first utilize sensing and learning systems to identify living organisms and non-human environmental patterns across the site. Um, the system would then seek to seek evidence of human influence and begin operations to assist non-human actors at the site, um, such as uh, in encouraging plant growth to transform environmental patterns towards conditions um, without the evidence of human influence. In conducting these operations, the system would learn the most effective strategies to promote non-human agency. As operations proceed, learning would continue as ecological succession um, processes transpire, such that the system might develop and enact entirely different algorithms and algorithms and behaviors over time, which would be unique to the wilderness creator and unique to the, um, its connections with its current context, um, and potentially un unanticipated by any prior system behavior. So this, I would, I would, I would begin to argue, creates a new space for the creation of uh, kind of environmental conditions. And so if we start to think about the ways um, different, uh, different uh, environments are, are constructed or, or um, form, 
Um, this puts this idea of this created wilderness or created wildness up in the upper right corner. Um, it is a space that is seemingly without human influence, but, but highly maintained and, 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 and in a way holds these kind of contradictions um, about itself. What we see also is that there's a, um, a lot of uh, infrastructures, projects, uh, ways of interfacing the world that actually sit within this um, realm already. Uh, these kind of um, uh, rewilding projects, autonomous infrastructures, um, different forms of uh, field ro robotics for agricultural management, um, and I would argue some climate engineering projects. So one of these kind of versions is uh, the, the Cotspot, and this is probably something many, many of you have seen, but the Cotspot is a, a, a drone developed to ameliorate the effects of the crown of thorn starfish on the Great Barrier Reef um, in Australia. Um, interestingly, the, the, the proliferation of the crown of thorn starfish comes from anthropogenic influences, essentially agricultural runoff that's providing, uh, that's providing a large amount of nutrients into the water system and, and, and um, creating an imbalance. The crown of thorn starfish is uh, eating away at the Great Barrier Reef. The, um, the drone moves through the water um, using image analysis to scan the reef, um, and it processes this through a neural network. Um, in order to begin to um, learn how to spot the crown of thorn starfish. Um, it, it, acquires its, it acquires its target, the starfish, and using, using the uh, learning over the, over the past um, uh, several years, uh, machine learning, sorry, over the past several years, it's gone from a 65% to 99% accuracy in its ability to identify and um, target uh, the, the starfish. Once it's targeted the starfish, it essentially lowers its probe injects um, the starfish with a brine solution, killing it, um, and then uh, pulls its probe back up and searches for its next target. Um, and it, it, once released, it runs autonomously um, and, and can kill up to 200 starfish in a single run, and then is recollected again, um, filled with brine solution and, and sent back out. The, um, the, you know, what, what you see in that kind of case then is essentially the creation of a new predator with a kind of minimal intelligence that is that is coming going out into the world to ameliorate anthropogenic uh, influences. In this case, um, uh, the crown of thorn starfish. So, to kind of wrap this up here. We might ask ourselves then, particularly as we move forward and we're beginning to think about uh, deconstruction of, of um, environments uh, in, in this um, in this kind of age of what what this seminar is calling climate frictions. Ask yourself how much wildness can um, can we tolerate, um, and generally, can humanity tolerate wildness that may pose in, an existential threat? For us um, humans, wildness must exist somewhere else. So it is important that humanity see highly maintained wildness through an ever evolving aesthetic experience that produces landscapes that are perceived as other but perform without threat. In that case, wildness becomes accessible over time as humanity is hidden from the maintenance and assumes this newly forming environment um, that poses no perceptible threat has its own agency um, as its formation is outside of our conception. So thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now without further ado, we will continue on with Catherine Griffiths. Okay, so, well, first of all, thank you to Hayden, Deborah, and Provides for the invitation today. Um, I'd like to do a presentation that shows a, some excerpts of several projects um, from my practice that show the, the approach that I work with, which is a sort of combination of um, media arts and critical computation and, and the digital humanities. Um, so I, I want to show work that um, demonstrates the shift from thinking about data visualization as it was practiced several years ago to thinking more about uh, critical data studies approach and also this shift from like a notion of territory that's geographically situated to one that um, entails a more like political situatedness. 
Um, so this is a piece, um, Alluvium, from a few years ago, that um, it's an example of what well, at the time I was experimenting with like a cinematic data visualization. Um, so it's a piece that's set, um, or it started with a, a research study <clears throat> conducted by some scientists in um, a site in Death Valley in California. Um, and it was the site was meaningful uh, because it has implications for the impact of floodwaters um, coming from global warming and the sort of con geomorphical consequences on the landscape. Um, so for me, the, the piece was kind of taking the data and the um, measurements and model from the study and trying to think about how to initially just make it more accessible in a way um, by visualizing it. Um, and the, so for me, it's using more like virtual cinematic visualization capabilities in combination with um, more traditional photograph, like legacy photographic uh, camera work. Um, and at the time I was thinking about like, how do you make abstract data like more palpable to some extent to an audience? even imbue it with a sort of somewhat sensual quality perhaps. Um, and also thinking about ideas that come from what we might call situated practices um, to place abstract data sort of back in its original location and original place and sort of trying to understand its, uh, the meaning in data um, through a relationship with its kind of provenance, if you like. Okay, um, so a, another piece that's um, sort of from the same series of, of data visualization um, using environmental data. Um, and in this, this visualization, I was thinking about how similarly with this situatedness in terms of a sort of cinematic aesthetic for abstract data and how that could support a sense of even like positionality of, of the person who's visualizing or the person who's creating the data and sense of perspective in the way that we look at data and to some extent move away from this idea of this criticism of like the the view from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Um, so this, this um, visualization, it shows a collection of various data from um, remote sense data of the landscape and the, um, and the Los Angeles River Basin and um, government nutri water nutrient data that was collected from um, the environmental um, protection agency and it's also combines with um, a local project from a group of citizen scientists who when I was looking at the data I realized like that, that their data was actually far more comprehensive than the, the EPA data. Um, so similarly to the last project it's it's using a combination of um, like virtual cinematic tactics and tropes, um, things, thinking about things like sort of cinematic pacing and framing of data, um, things like the way we kind of light an environment for data, like lighting data and get things like depth of field um, to kind of focus the eye, things like that. Um, but then in juxtaposition with uh, photographic imagery from the kind of specific local communities from where the data was collected. So trying to kind of draw a relationship um, between those, uh, those two things. So, so an, another project, um, after I started, you know, working with data and its visualization, for a while, I became more aware, more interested in what the process, asking what the process is of 
kind of algorithmic process or the computational processes that create these visualizations. Um, and there was this emerging recognition that data and consequently its visualization are not necessarily so objective or particularly truthful at times, but there are particular framing of an issue um, and potentially subjective. Um, so this, oops, sorry. So these images um, were the beginning of an exploration um, of that of the, of the system that visualizes data rather than just data being the kind of end goal or the visualization being the end goal itself. Um, and I'm here I'm working with a photogrammetry workflow that uses video as its input and produces a point cloud um, as a data set. Um, and the, the kind of visualization here is sort of visualization of the reverse engineering of the position, the original positions of the camera as it was moved around to capture, photographically capture this environment that, that led to this data set. So animating a computational connection between the data set um, that is perspectival less um, and, um, and a connection to that singular original connection that actually has a human body behind it. Um, and I was also thinking about things like, um, you know, machine vision um, and specifically an approach to a critical algorithm scholar called Joy Bulamwini has, she refers to it as the, the coded gaze, like thinking of the, hist the historical idea of the gaze and how that passes through into machine vision and, and the kind of ideology of that vision. Um, so trying to think about this, this project, trying to think about, um, yeah, positionality and how to interpret that computational functionality through a more social lens or ideological lens and, and using a visualization in a more reflect, reflexive way to think about the technology and the visualization process itself. So then continuing away from working with data that sometimes has this quality of being kind of fixed and retrospective, um, I started to look more into the tools of visualization. Um, so in previous projects that might have been camera tracking and photogrammetry, um, and now looking at um, which come from computer vision. Um, and so I started to look more specifically at um, the OpenCV computer library uh, for, for computer vision um, and trying to explore more specifically its functionality and kind of analyze that code in the same way that one might analyze data um, in a data visualization. And also working with this approach of like, how does one reverse engineer a computational function in order to think critically um, about that functionality. Um, I was also thinking about the open, the social context of the OpenCV library, um, the fact that it um, incorporates facial recognition technologies um, and object recognition and different methods of surveillance. Um, so in a way, as a, a live, from one perspective, uh, a computer vision library is a somewhat kind of neutral technology, and from another, it's increasingly politicized. So I wanted to think about that library and its code, look, code functions through that lens. Um, so this, this project kind of just combines a series of visualizations um, that try to go through the library somewhat and look at how, the way that different functions are kind of layered on top of each other um, to make sense of an image of the world. Um, 
So this thing that we call machine vision. And I was also, um, I'd also started to work with a, an approach from the digital humanities that's known as critical code studies, which sees code as um, source code as like a cultural text that's worthy of interpretation. So I was, I was kind of um, working with that. Um, so these animations are um, kind of more simple pixel manipulations of maps. This is a particular site, a long-run site in the, uh, in the Amazon rainforest um, called the Meeting of the Waters. Um, and, and so in this case, it's just observing in a computer vision library the way an algorithm understands an image very simply and the way that it has to undergo an image undergoes a process of like quite extreme simplification. Um, the way that an image of the world from a camera is sort of reduced in complexity in order to be computable. Um, and then a function like this in the same library that's um, interpreting an image from an urban, of an urban surveillance camera. Um, You know, there's a more actual representation of what it sees versus the information that's available to compute with. Um, and then this was part of um, an exhibition piece for a show on the topic of surveillance. Um, and it's kind of a play on these logics of computer vision, but using a video of a chameleon. And I kind of like the contrast um, between this image of a sort of ancient animal that's visualized by this supposed cutting edge technology. Um, so in nature, the chameleon sort of camouflages itself through stillness and reveals itself through, through motion. Um, and here in this algorithm, this is captured by the way that pixels of the image are only visible to the algorithm when the chameleon moves and, um, and when the chameleon is still, they're unavailable or resistant. Um, so before I show a, a, just a final project, um, I wanted to just think through some of the critical data issues that I'm interested in um, that I think is a, a sort of pertinent space um, for thinking about data in this new landscape of ethics and equity inquiries. Um, and is the source of this idea of like situatedness that I'm interested in. Um, so in order to move away from ideas about code agnosticism um, and move towards more of an understanding of code in context or also by implication data in context, um, I think uh, I'm interested in looking at this emerging discourse um, for in favor of situatedness and contextualism in, in data and algorithmic tools. So for me, Yanni Lukasas, um, in his book, All Data Are Local, argues for the idea that there's no such thing as, as data um, or technology without a context. And so is proposing to move away from this term data set, which is kind of rooted, um, which is sort of evokes more of a sense of, you know, the discrete and the complete. Um, and instead to try and grapple with this idea of data settings. So, you know, which points to how data cannot be or is rooted in a sense of place and time and perhaps local nuance. Um, so using um, I think something else he also argues is that um, the way that data sets are kind of highly portable in many ways, and I think this goes the same for algorithms. Um, portable and somewhat redu reductive, especially in the way they're used in, in deep learning algorithms, which is a piece that I want to show next. Um, 
in favour of um, making these predictions about complex and messy issues. So Lucas is really asking us when we're working with data and by implication algorithms to reconsider data sort of locality and it's com more complex attachments to place. Where did it come from? Who produced it? What instruments were used to collect it? Um, what kind of ideology was built into those instruments that we used to connect, to connect it? Um, and how to kind of make more visible those qualities. Um, so, and then another, another set of ideas for situatedness. I think it's in, important to reference the work of Donna Haraway, who's perhaps a bit more famous for her book, Cyborg Manifesto, but also um, wrote this paper called Situated Knowledges. Um, and it's her proposal to think of apply feminist thinking to science and data studies. So supposed feminist critiques of, of masculinity and objectivity and power were applied to the production of scientific knowledge. So in the case that we might arrive at this form of what she argues is more situated knowledge, one in which like positionality and subjectivity um, and the way that those things are inherently contestable are considered in, in how we produce knowledge. We think, think about knowledge production. Um, and I think the concept of situated knowledge um, is being drawn on by various um, scholars in computational ethics uh, to propose a way to counteract some sense of like false neutrality and drive toward agnosticism in data and algorithmic processes. Um, the authors of Data Feminism, Catherine Dignazio and, and Laura Klein, Lauren Klein, um, also draw on uh, Donna Haraway's idea of situated knowledge as in the way that then context matters um, for making sense of how of correlations when working with data. Um, and just acknowledging that the way situated knowledge is sort of a let a central legacy of feminist thinking that supports a, me a means of addressing issues of responsibility and ethics in knowledge production. Um, and so I see my work as um, trying also to grapple with this notion of situatedness as moving maybe in the earlier work from a more literal territorial in situ quality um, of kind of data visualization especially in projects where data has a direct relationship with the environment. Maybe it is environmental data. And so that situatedness is more um, obvious and maybe moving to a, a notion of political situatedness in the way that I am trying to visualize algorithmic process and structure um, also in training data sets. So, I just want to show one, some, one other project called Convolutional Labor Domains. Um, and this is an excerpt of a, a body of work that I developed in my PhD work at USC in LA that focuses more on the ethics of algorithms and the problem of interpretability in machine learning um, and tries to combine this methodology between critical code studies and visualization. And so this piece um, is it's an, an excerpt of a, of a larger, what I would call a critical software project. Um, so it is a self-contained software application um, that considers a suite of machine learning algorithms that are known as activity recognition algorithms um, and they use surveillance video surveillance images as an input and also as, as their training data set to to track and recognize bodies in space at increasingly micro scales um, and they're being proposed for various workplaces as a way of monitoring the productivity of workers and as a future form of what we might call disembodied uh, labor management. So this um, video is a, just a, a screen recording of the application 
and the different scenes as you kind of go through the different functionality of the algorithm. Um, so on the one hand, it's a visualization of an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, um, including its node structure. Um, but it's also trying to grapple with this idea of sort of co the contestation um, of, of algorithms. Um, so this work was, it, it's partly referencing some recent research that's been published in computer science um, that is being tested out on construction sites. Um, and so using surveillance cameras, um, building up data sets from those video cameras and training an algorithm to recognize sort of discrete worker tasks, if you like. And then those tasks are organized into categories like product in a, like a range of productivity types. Um, and if you dig into the code, you can see things like um, things like that the algorithm is trained to recognize when someone picks up a bottle of water, for instance, and the fact that that activity is coded by the programmers as being non-productive. And so you can start to build up a sense of um, a set of values that um, lie behind these decisions as to what, how to encode different bodily actions. Um, so this is just a short excerpt of a piece that I, I mean, it's, it's a, in an exhibition right now in Michigan, at the University of Michigan. Um, and it kind of, it's for me, it's an approach to take this algorithm and instead of using it as a tool to do what it's built for, um, using a source code as a cultural text that's meant for a different kind of interpretation. So for me, it's about building critical software application, software that's a tool for contestation. You know, it's meant to contest the algorithm that it's running off um, and contesting sort of assumptions about the interpretability of that, of the interpretability problem in machine learning and these so-called explainable AI solutions. And so in, in a piece like this, it's thinking about the way the ethical problems um, arise in these systems, um, the way that um, you know, people can't appeal the decisions of the algorithm, um, and in a, in perhaps in a, understood in a kind of post-pandemic context, where there's this shift towards remote management, um, so a shift from human labor relations into say, algorithmic labor relations. And I think it's pertinent in, in the context of um, recent win by Amazon factory workers in New York to form a union in the face of this kind of disembodied management practices uh, through surveillance and, and activity recognition algorithms. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I believe our next presenter is Andrew Witt. Fantastic. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, oops. Um, okay, well, first of all, thanks so much again for the invitation, uh, Hater, Deborah, and Provides. It's been, it, they've been fantastic presentations so far, and I can't wait for the discussion. I'm, it's, it's been uh, eye opening uh, and really stimulating for me. So, Today, I'd actually like to lean into a little bit the sort of like fictions aspect of the framing and present some ideas on extending architecture towards ways of um, monitoring, observing, communicating, uh, fictionalizing, I guess, in a way, our relationship with uh, nature through a bioremediation control room and ecological panorama for the 21st century. So first, just a few words about our studio. I was briefly introduced at the beginning of the uh, of the seminar. Certain Measures is a studio that bridges architecture, art, and technology uh, to confront systemic challenges. And we're particularly interested in the shared world of humans, machines, and nature, and how all of those intersect and interact through uh, data. 
So we omnivorously embrace working across scales uh, from the material to the planetary. And we've worked in industries as diverse as finance, manufacturing, government, and medical devices, in addition to design and architecture. So um, I'd like to share one particular project that tries to demonstrate a little bit this transscalar and synthetic uh, approach. Um, just for broader context, our work sort of symbiotically tries to connect uh, software and hardware prototyping. Uh, and each project has those two manifestations. On the one hand, a physical manifestation, and the other hand, uh, a sort of virtual or digital manifestation. Uh, there are two ways into the thinking around a systemic approach to a particular uh, issue. So uh, we're generating uh, software tools and data portraits that address these challenges. And on the other hand, producing models, architectures, uh, and products that try to inflect or uh, change the terms of the uh, of the game with those challenges. Um, so we've we've done work around uh, radical material reuse, swarm domestic spaces, anatomically customized medical devices, and uh, urban morphological scanning, uh, to name a few. So our approach is sort of naturally transdisciplinary, uh, and we put an analytically, what we hope is an analytically rigorous core of design in communication with intellectual frameworks from philosophy, history, and mathematics. And so each of these three disciplines uh, provides access to uh, distinct framings for uh, addressing systemic problems and thereby enriching the sort of core of, um, of the design perspective. So since mathematics is sort of the lingua franca of all the sciences and data science is quickly sort of joining it, a mathematical core allows us to flexibly build relationships between and across the various sciences. And so the results of those interconnections are various products uh, from the cultural to the industrial uh, and architectural. So today I wanted to share a project that sort of applies these methods towards uh, the challenge of bioremediation. So the project is part of a newly opened museum of the future uh, in Dubai. As built to transform the perception of the future as we know it. Uh, the Museum of the Future is the home to immersive environments that position visitors in an empowering vision of tomorrow. So across each floor of the museum, the, the visitor steps into a speculative world of uh, 2071. Uh, visitors experience a space station, a therapeutic clinic, uh, and uh, an institute for global biodiversity, uh, to name a few. And it's that last project that I'd like to um, weave into. So for the museum, uh, certain measures imagined a future observatory for planetary ecology. And this observatory is a, is a kind of control room panorama incubator uh, for newly designed species developed to address ongoing challenges of the climate crisis. So uh, it's the culmination actually of a floor wide exhibit that imagines a fictional NGO called the HEAL Institute that's tasked with gathering the planet's genetic material um, the engineering species capable of meeting challenges of extreme climate uh, and redeploying these uh, into the world. So the new space, our, our space, uh, consists of two parts. So first, th there's a geoscope on the one hand and a nursery on the other. So the geoscope is a quantitatively driven global monitoring system uh, that visualizes the, pro the progress of bespoke species uh, deployed to aid threatened biomes. So through immersive projection mapping, the geoscope offers a kind of transcalar and data rich view of the planet from global to, uh, to microscopic. Uh, it combines physical models with dynamic projections uh, to show symbiotic interconnections uh, across scales. So it's something that tries to actually defy a certain scalar categorization around, um, around ecology. So, uh, in conscious response to Buckminster Fuller's geoscopes, R sees the world not as an extractive system, but as, an, as a replenishing one in which humans has a, have a vital role to play in that, uh, in that replenishment, a symbiotic role to play. Uh, as a digital globe turns at the center, it reveals new points of uh, intervention, crisis, um, and uh, action, represents a continuously changing view into, the network of, into a network of monitoring stations across the planet. So the, the sort of like fiction, I mean, there are many layers of fiction here, I guess, but one of the fictional aspects of this is that there's a sort of uh, coordinating AI that dynamically connects a number of human and non-human agents, uh, including drones, satellites, and hybrid techno-biological sensors 
who are constantly collecting samples, monitoring climate, uh, and rebuilding the, the, um, uh, the planet specimen by specimen. So this AI is sort of slowly becoming more aware of human responsibility for anthropogenic climate change, and also sort of coming to terms with its own uh, place in the role, in the process of sort of uh, regreening the earth. So the data visualization becomes a glimpse into the sort of uh, emerging consciousness of this, uh, of this AI. So we drew inspiration from a whole history of planetary visualizations of the past century and a half, century and a half. Uh, but our aim was to sort of um, extend or perhaps subvert some of these into a simultaneous and multi-scalar view of uh, the many interdependence aspects of uh, planetary ecology. We were also inspired by various scientific cabinets, uh, particularly the Tyler's Museum in uh, Harlem in the Netherlands, uh, which offered a kind of magical and varied wunderkammer of particulars uh, drawn from the natural environment. So this was, but this was actually something like the opposite of the holistic view that we just mentioned. And so really what we wanted to convey with uh, the experience of the space was this kind of like federation or interweaving or interlacing of all of those different scales simultaneously uh, as, um, as, uh, as one organism. So the geoscope thus presents a sort of control room for bioremediation showing an evolving web of life. And so you see not only these various scales, but also the interrelationships between them sort of trace through the projection, uh, um, the projection of the media. So an integral part of this geoscope are the myriad vignettes that show in zoomed in detail, the thriving species introduced by the Heal Institute. So these include, for example, uh, a signal cone jelly at the left, which is a swarm superorganism that sort of signals danger by bioluminescent, bioluminescent flashes. And at the right, cryptobiotic wildflowers, some robust hibernating vegetation uh, that can survive in steppe and tundra regions. Uh, other species, and I use that term somewhat loosely, include an observation robot seahorse, a kind of biomechanical drone uh, for checking micro plastic density, CO2 content, temperature fluctuation, uh, and, uh, and a fire resistant tree, which you see on the right, uh, with uh, robust roots to, resist the, uh, to re resist the danger of climate emergencies. So the geoscope also affords glimpses into the research of the scientists uh, themselves who work tirelessly to sort of uh, confirm the success or ensure the success of this regreening of the planet. So through field work, these scientists engage with deployed species and document their progress. And so there's a way in which the, the entire experience is sort of this, um, this play between physical artifacts, actual footage, uh, computer generated images and data visualization that connects them all. Um, so we even witnessed moments in uh, the, labs of the Institute, these moments of careful analysis and sample preparation uh, to uh, evaluate and review soil toxins, trace, carbo trace um, carbohydrates, and uh, investigate other critical biomarkers. So uh, the geoscope thus becomes this kind of like multi-scalar uh, panorama of hopefully a sort of optimistic possible bio future. So the nursery is sort of the other half of this experience. And in this second half, visitors peer into incubators nurturing dozens of species uh, that could revitalize a struggling planet. So in collaboration with a geneticist, we designed over 80 species of plants, uh, insect and animal uh, and fungus, I guess, uh, each with special characteristics uh, designed to combat uh, climate challenges um, of today and the future. The nursery shows uh, the accelerated growth process of these species enhanced with holographic data profiles uh, of each specimen. So drawn from a range of biomes, we imagine species uh, such as a nutrient rich jelly cactus, radiation sequestering flowers, seed dispersal snails, or lipid rich quinoa, which collectively formed a sort of biological menagerie. Um, one more sort of like, uh, one more example was the uh, uh, 
remediation coral designed to shelter reef dependent species while feeding on microplastics and sequestering uh, heavy metals. So each one of these species had a role or multiple roles to play. And actually when the room was, um, uh, when the room was conceived, the idea was to create networks of symbiotic species that interact at various, uh, at various scales. So this is a supercut of all the physical dioramas of the models. So we worked with a highly skilled uh, German art fabricator, ID3D, which I can't say enough good things about. Um, uh, they are responsible for, for producing the, these models that we designed. And I think they rival the detail of dioramas in the best natural history museums. Each species was meticulously, re meticulously researched, complete with a scientific name. Um, and as I mentioned before, certain climate robust features and estimated life cycles. So there's kind of an encyclopedic impulse in their collection and an attempt to convey uh, a variety of possibility um, uh, of nature across climates. So I mentioned one or two examples in detail. Uh, so this is sort of like an incubator within an incubator uh, uh, with an aim of rapid repopulation. This portable multi-species egg incubator can be used to quickly reestablish biological diversity in uh, previously uh, inhospitable areas. So the idea is that this is one thing that we actually didn't get a chance to show in the um, in the exhibit. But the idea is that these species would be loaded into certain kinds of drop ships, and then the drop ships would sort of like deliver them into these uh, into these remote locations uh, where they would be tended and um, and encouraged. So each one of these uh, each one of these incubators is something that in principle could be loaded. Onto this, um, onto this dropship. And here we have a radiation sequestering flower engineered to remediate nuclear waste storage sites uh, by absorbing radioactive isotopes through their roots uh, and into their petals. So at the microscopic scale, we've designed bacteria that symbiotically supported our new species um, and also larger biomes. So many were paired with um, organisms to create beneficial dyads. And so these bacteria, including uh, cancer hunting, sunscreen producing, and heavy, heavy, metal, heavy metal sequestering uh, varieties. Um, so as I mentioned, each species sort of featured a holographic data viz overlay, which is really difficult to sort of like convey in a presentation, but in the space, it's really, um, it's, it's really pretty cool. Um, this is a highly accelerated view of all of these synchronized sort of holographic displays through which you can see the dioramas beyond. So there's about 80 different species across seven major ecosystems, including desert, aquatic, Arctic, forest, swamp, alpine, and grassland. Um, I, there are sort of these attempts to uh, address the varied and systemic um, threats of anthropogenic uh, climate change. So um, finally, we were, um, oops, okay. We were interested in the post-human perspective also of the sentient AI monitoring the earth and the observatory. What were the sort of like realizations that this AI was coming to as they're seeing this crisis sort of, uh, sort of unfold? How were they coming to terms with this catastrophe and their role in the rebirth of the planet? So uh, since, AI, since the AI communicates with the visitor uh, and this larger network of remote agents through transmissions, we became really fascinated by what's called the epistolary uh, novel as a precedent. So the epistolary novel is a story written entirely in letters back and forth between uh, the main characters. It has a very pretty long history actually. And um, uh, ironically is, uh, uh, ironically Frankenstein, one of arguably the first sort of like uh, biofiction works uh, is a work of epistolary fiction. Uh, we were also inspired by epistolary fiction that had a sort of like technical dimension. So uh, there's sort of like subgenre of email fiction, which is an epistolary uh, form, uh, which we which we drew on as this um, as a precedent for sort of these uh, electrical message exchange. And then the sort of like emerging genre of coming of age AI stories, where an AI becomes sort of like gradually aware of the context in which uh, in which it's embedded. So. Uh, uh, Ishiguro's Claire in the Sun, I think, is an interesting uh, contemporary example. Uh, at the same time, we were interested in these sort of like panorama books. The, uh, the space uh, has the ambition to be a sort of panorama. Could we uh, encapsulate that in a book? 
And so the result is a kind of like a pistolary um, AI biofuture fiction that imagines instead of every building on the sunset strip, it imagines sort of like every species uh, uh, planted on the planet. So you have this sort of like narrative structure where you orbit, the AI basically orbits the planet once and through that exchange, it becomes gradually more and more aware um, of its place in this uh, in this larger system. It has something of sort of like a crisis of conscience about um, uh, about its role. So anyway, the project has um, has gotten some some interesting international attention. So it's like alive and well, I guess, um, out in the world. So you know, this the project I think represents you know hopefully an interesting opportunity for architects to. Uh, uh, span into adjacent disciplines, but also think about uh, the representation of this interconnected world in, uh, in a synthetic, specific, but also sort of imaginative and um, ambitious, perhaps optimistic uh, way. So that's, that's what I have. Thank you very much. I think the next uh, presenter is uh... Hello. That was really interesting. Uh, all of it. Um, I want to thank uh, UCL and the and the Bartlett and uh, Deborah and Hadin for inviting me. Uh, I don't know how much more in depth in science fiction I will go into, but uh, let's see. Um, Try and share. Uh, should be able to see my screen. So, um, picking up from Andrew and the kind of notion that uh, you can uh, design anything, uh, including the biome, right? One of my um, discoveries is that you can design an economy, and we'll be discussing. Uh, um, some of it here. Uh, so I will be presenting uh, part of the prototype we have been building with uh, ArcChain and a kind of grand vision of how you can use blockchain technologies in architectural design. Um, for those of you that don't know what blockchain is, uh, it is essentially the technology behind uh, cryptocurrencies. You might have also heard of uh, non-fungible tokens or even DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. So blockchain is a really simple uh, technology in the sense that you have a ledger that records transactions, and this is uh, re um, kept into a distributed uh, network where each of the nodes holds a copy of the network. And through various algorithmic um, uh, uh, measures, uh, the nodes reach a consensus between them. Now, the interesting bit is not that, uh, even though you'll hear people complaining about the uh, energy expenditure of blocks, and which always is compared with a country with a failed economy like Argentina or Greece. Um, but the interesting part is that the fact that you can run smart contracts on it. So essentially you have a distributed global computer that you can run code on. So keep that in mind while we're talking about the technology. Um, the next thing I want to introduce is uh, a book by Byung Chul Han, who is a philosopher, a Korean philosopher, but uh, operating in Germany, called Sanjai, Deconstruction in Chinese, that goes into the notion of the copy and how um, Asia, and, and much more specifically China, is innovative by uh, having a much more uh, rich understanding of copying uh, as copying from the masters. And this is a notion that maybe has been lost in the West. Now, um, in two pages of the book, uh, Joel Tulhan introduces the uh, seals of Chinese scholars, which at least within uh, Chinese uh, culture uh, represents the scholars themselves. And um, you can see here the uh, kind of landscape uh, from Chinese calligraphy where a, a certain scholar is about to move on to a new post and uh, his friends essentially sign the, um, the artwork uh, with their own signature and with their own poems. So if you ever felt that non-fungible tokens are not real, here's a, an example from the past where you have a 
an artwork which has been signed essentially, maybe not cryptographically, but has been signed by others to uh, create and verify its validity. Another later, uh, latest inspiration is this book uh, edited by uh, Space Cavia, presented at the Venice Biennale, talking about non-extractive architecture and how we need to kind of change the discipline uh, from a, a discipline that uh, essentially extracts materials um, and resources from the environment to, to a discipline that is a little bit more circular or regenerative. Um, and the story kind of begins, uh, or, or at least the kind of modern uh, understanding of a, of a political economy begins about two centuries ago, but one of the most uh, characteristics, criticisms that uh, for modern architecture that has been forgotten uh, lies with uh, Manfred Tafuri on his critique of architectural ideology uh, and on his architectural utopia work, where taking a Marxist view uh, kind of criticizes the modern production of architecture um, and uh, sets essentially a kind of impossible situation for architects where uh, Tafuri basically says that you need to be complicit within capitalism to produce architecture. And that is essentially a trap. Um, and essentially all of the discussions about uh, the application of blockchain in architecture or the wider AC industry talk about the economy and governance and the, how, you, how do you make decisions essentially, right? And what is the economy uh, of architecture uh, driving at? Now, part of... Um, essentially the star, star architecture system that developed through the 80s and 90s kind of responded to Tafuri by basically uh, saying, well, we will engage, but at the same time, we will be critical, right? And this is a uh, phrase by uh, Bernard Chumi in the Ennis Symposium in the US, uh, where he basically says, we cannot uh, stop capitalism, we cannot block it, we cannot uh, you know, oppose it directly, but essentially what we can do is use judo as a kind of technique where you um, use the forces of one's opponents in order to defeat it and transform it into something else. Uh, and the question remains, to what extent can we move away from a descriptive critical mode to a progressive transform transformative mode for architecture? Um, and this was all taking place in uh, an environment where uh, we are collectively responsible, uh, whether we like it or not, whether we agree or not with the science uh, with 39% of all carbon emissions, um, with 28 of that, 27 if you read other uh, um, research publications being related to energy expenditure, uh, so what we call operational carbon, and about 11 to 12% uh, remaining uh, related to produce to production and embodied carbon. So what do we do with this, right? So we have essentially been developing uh, a series of prototypes using blockchain as a peer-to-peer -peer technology to be able to redefine how you kind of create a political economy for architecture. Um, and the kind of main idea started in 2017 where we worked on a competition with my very dear colleague, David Lombardi, uh, where we uh, participated in a competition by the Chinese state on creating a new city in Ilong in Guizhou province, uh, right at the moment where I was leaving China and uh, getting, uh, getting back to Europe in Scotland. Um, and we designed this city that would use essentially uh, blockchain nodes as, heat, as heaters, right? So they would be distributed around the city uh, and around housing so that they you would use the extra additional heat uh, from the nodes to kind of hit your home. And the idea here is that we would kind of resist the very uh, established orthodoxy of the master plan that was called for from the brief. And we were lucky enough to actually uh, receive the third award in out of, I think, 1,208 um, submissions. Now, the idea here is that it got us back into thinking, how can we use blocks in with a combination of generative systems to create a, a kind of different view on architecture? And we came up with, um, after about two years of work with the framework for decentralized and architectural design, where we essentially tried to establish a way to use smart contracts uh, to create what we call a decentralized autonomous organization, an organization run on the blockchain, um, to design, construct, and operate. Um, the uh, paper you see here only deals with the design part of it, and also we are 
kind of cheating because we're also only dealing with optimization. But there are other papers that discuss uh, voting systems or a consensus system for uh, designs with DAO. Um, and essentially, this builds through a series of smart contracts that we have deployed, right? So uh, you'll see uh, the, 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 the diagrams, but this is a real prototype voting where you have a, a smart contract uh, taking care of the stakeholder side, right? So the problem owner, and then a smart contract that deals with the solution. Um, and then you use smart contracts and the interplanetary file system. This is uh, essentially a distributed file system that is global and uses content IDs rather than uh, location IDs for content, right? So if you upload a model, this will be unique for the whole world uh, as it uses cryptography to, to pass it and identify it. And through this system, we are able to uh, synchronize solutions among many, uh, many participants, right? So we can scale to the level where you might have 400 designers at the same time or 1,000 designers at the same time using the system. Um, and we kind of scale, scaled it to uh, think both of the kind of competition scenario as you would have classically in an architectural competition where a very few get rewarded or a collaborative scenario where the rewards through cryptocurrencies are shared between uh, all of the design agents that participate in the solution. Note here that a design agent doesn't mean a human uh, per se, but it might be essentially also an AI or machine learning algorithm. And what we prototyped is essentially a very nice and easy uh, way to work with uh, uh, Topologic, Grasshopper, and Dynamo. Topologic is a, a library developed by my colleague uh, Vasim Jabi from Cardiac University that allows us essentially to create a, a beam light solutions, solutions that don't use the full range of uh, BIN models, but use topology essentially to uh, break down a building into its basic constituents. And through that, we are able to launch, uh, you'll see screenshots of the prototype working. So there's a local blockchain running on my machine. You deploy the smart contracts to them. Uh, this is the web interface of how it handles essentially a competitive scenario uh, through the problem optimizer. And you'll see all of the hashes that are declared each time someone uh, uploads a new file. Um, this is a screenshot of uh, one of the files downloaded onto Grasshopper and uh, the plugin that we developed essentially to talk from Grasshopper onto, uh, onto smart contracts. We now have the capability to do that through Grasshopper, Dynamo, but also as virtual on Blender. Um, and essentially, we showed how easy it is to kind of create an integration between computer whole design platforms and the Ethereum blockchain um, and set up a conceptual and computational infrastructure to ensure immutable and trustworthy activities. Uh, but what does that mean, essentially, right? So um, in the collaborative scenario through this, you can set up uh, a kind of collective where uh, funds and rewards are shared between designers that contribute to the design problem. Uh, without needing essentially to establish a way to collaborate be, be before that, or even set up a, a particular infrastructure, project infrastructure uh, to uh, maintain solutions or, or explain solutions. So what happens here, designer two finds a, um, an important contribution, right? Uploads that, uh, our system essentially notes it down, but also synchronizes this through IPFS with the other designers. And later down the line, designer three uh, uh, creates something important and uploads that. And again, you have a synchronization, but also much more importantly, you have a sharing of funds between these designers. The um, competitive scenario obviously is much more uh, straightforward, but potentially less appealing in terms of uh, the kind of uh, collaborative scenarios where you don't share files, right? But you only get paid uh, when you find uh, uh, um, or upload a, a good solution to the optimization problem. Uh, obviously, this gets a little bit more complicated when you are dealing with uh, the wicked problems of design, right? So you need to have a way to uh, note down design inflection points. Uh, so important moments in design where designers potentially have uh, found uh, a great strategy to address what they're doing. And that might not be quantifiable, but actually a, a qualitative uh, aspect. So you might need uh, uh, aspects of consensus that are a little bit more 
uh, soft and don't deal with uh, numbers through the algorithm. But at the same time, the principle applies. You can uh, use the blockchain essentially to, to note those down and uh, synchronize through our system. Um, this is topologic run on uh, Zvertshok and Blender, right? Zvertshok is a, a, an open source uh, node-based system and topologic runs there on, on a library. And we have kind of created a really nice system where you can create non-fungible tokens directly through Blender. Uh, the idea here is that you break down a building into its topological entities um, and are able essentially to break down rooms, uh, walls. Uh, each room also has obviously the, the topology of the components belonging onto it. And by creating an ERC721, that's a template for a smart contract uh, NFT for each one of those components, you can create essentially the digital infrastructure for a circular economy that is persistent and uh, can uh, and trustworthy uh, as you go forward. So from my point of view, you can essentially record um, the existing buildings on a blockchain and then have that information 30 or 40 or 50 years down the line, irrespective of whether your organization you worked for exists or not, or is even incentivized to keep that information. Um, we showcase this on Dynamo on Revit. Uh, the connectors work through Python. Um, and you can see here kind of easy, um, simplified diagram of how an NFT works, right? So you have a smart contract with an NFT registry and uh, the number of the NFT uh, corresponds to the metadata registry on the interplanetary file system. Uh, our software stack uh, works with Topologic, Eddie Vacan kind of Visual Programming, the three I mentioned, and through Python uh, and the web3.py uh, library, you can essentially uh, work with an Ethereum smart contract and IPFS in a circular kind of way. Uh, and you can see now what the uh, topologic will actually transmit onto the uh, smart contract, but this essentially is the core of the, uh, the metadata that can be then uh, brought into any other kind of platform uh, so that you can trace the columns I uh, have very clumsily designed for this um, uh, presentation. Uh, this is a a screenshot from our workshop in ICD in the past uh, September, where we managed to actually script uh, the whole thing visually, so no code required. And we will be releasing this in the next two months. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the kind of latest chapter that we are about to publish. We're editing a book with, we've actually finished with the editing and it's about to be um, published by uh, Springer Nature uh, with um, David Lombardi. So blockchain in construction and the work here discusses collective digital factories for buildings as a stigmergic collaboration through crypto economics. And the idea here is that we are trying to uh, make it explicit that we need to tackle issues of carbon waste, productivity and supply chains within uh, the architectural design world. Uh, in a kind of return to basics, uh, as Alberti would have it, where the architect is much more aware of uh, how and where the materials that uh, she has um, worked with are, are produced, but also to incentivize a different kind of economy on, on design. And the way that this works is that uh, you have this uh, whole cycle uh, of architectural design taking place through smart contracts, um, the design team, essentially, if they are to pick up a, a project, uh, they need to, to stake a token. Uh, so they need to kind of put money into the system to say, well, I have, I'm now a stakeholder, right? I have a skin in the game. And through that, they receive a governance token, right? So that's a, essentially a mechanism that we use on blockchain for consensus of voting. Uh, the, token, uh, the token staked represent a part of the uh, funding pool. Um, and at the same time, the, the design team essentially has stake, uh, tokens locked. Uh, through the governance, they are able to use a topologic model and make decisions throughout um, the life cycle of the project. Topologic is excellent in actually uh, acting as a proxy for a series of models, including BIM, energy, and a waste and circular model. Um, and through uh, design iterations uh, and consensus, the design team essentially builds 
and improves upon uh, a series of models that get recorded on a smart contract. Uh, through this, we are able essentially to uh, uh, incentivize uh, and connect waste reduction, carbon reduction, productivity increase, and, and building performance increase with an increase on the funds that the team will be paid from. So the main idea here is that you turn essentially waste and carbon not only onto numbers that you need to improve upon, but actually the currency architects will be paid with. Um, and at the same time, you can introduce within the system also uh, optimization algorithms or machine learning algorithms that would act as design agents. And our view is that these works as a much more collective and much more um, incentivized uh, understanding of how you could use peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems to create improved architectural design. And I'm going to close with a kind of a copy of uh, Bernard Chumi's phrase, right, but adapted for a much more of a collective. And I think we need to use uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu rather than judo to tackle the powers that, that uh, be. And thanks a lot. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, then we have uh, Damian. Um, so please feel free. Great. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yes. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. So uh, I'm Damian Ioannovic. I'm um, uh, based in Los Angeles. I teach at SciArc and I have my own. Uh, design practice called lifeforms.io. So in my work, I, I kind of work uh, at the intersection of architectural design and uh, software aesthetics and video games. So I'm kind of, I'm gonna present today, um, basically, I'm gonna present one project, which is an ongoing piece that we are working on uh, for this 2024 exhibition in Los Angeles called Pacific Standard Time. Um, which is organized by the Getty Institute and in kind of in collaboration with SciArc. Uh, the exhibition is called Views of Planet City and it's uh, curated by Liam Young. So the project uh, that I'm showing you today is called Planet Garden and it's, it's one of those, one of the projects in this exhibition. And uh, what, what I'm basically talking about today is this idea of a planetary simulation game. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, tackle a lot of different uh, aspects of, of this. And basically, but the first thing I just wanna put on the table is this idea of the simulation, which I kind of understand is both an interactive model of complex environmental conditions, but also kind of a new narrative structure for architectural thinking and world-making. So uh, what I, when I say a simulation, I, I mean a, a technical format, but I also mean um, a basically a, a way of kind of going beyond fictions or going beyond storytelling into, into modeling. So uh, the game uh, Planet Garden is based on the Edward O. Wilson's half Earth idea. And uh, in the game, we kind of model the scenario where the entire human population of the world occupies a single massive city and the rest is kind of left to plants and animals and rewilding. Uh, this is kind of an important and very interesting thought experiment. Um, it is almost a proto-design or a prompt uh, for this massive planetary agglomeration of urban matter, uh, which could liberate the rest of the planet. Um, so when, when this was presented, I started thinking about how to design something like this. Uh, what, what would it mean to actually model something of that scale? How do we ca capture all that complexity and nuance and how do we figure out stakes and variables and how do we come up with consequences, conclusions and so forth. Um, so here is the uh, Half Earth uh, digital platform, basically, which, which is a fantastic website owned by, by the uh, uh, Edward O. Wilson Foundation. And you can, you can go there and kind of experience the whole story from, from that point of view. Uh, but the story from, from kind of my point of view has to do more with, uh, with different kinds of, uh, let's say, another set of references that, that I was interested in, which is to kind of look into different uh, aspects of uh, video games and, and basically different practices, maybe at this point, historical practices of modeling systems that architects have uh, kind of look, tried and looked at. And... Um, and then also kind of doing uh, basically kind of a deep research into uh, planetary uh, 
uh, ideas of agriculture, energy, water, emissions, waste, and so forth, and kind of combining all of that into one um, idea, right, for the project. And also, I mean, one of the main parts of this project is, is the interest in representing and modeling at the intersection of art and science, which means like asking a question, how do we communicate today? How do we um, basically establish a way of understanding that goes beyond data visualization and that goes beyond maybe uh, making, making films or making drawings, which is kind of a, I would say a standard collection of, of uh, architectural tools that we that we all have and we all use still but is there is there another way that we can kind of reinvent a relationship uh, with the environment and this also has to do with uh, kind of in the classical sense uh, this is this is Goethe's diagram of, of kind of table elevations of the old and new world which is inspired by by Humboldt so I'm interested in this intersection between art and science in a, in a very basic way uh, in a classical sense, art makes the world sensible before science can make it intelligible. And I'm interested in kind of operating at, the, at that edge between and kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of thinking what this could be for, for the contemporary audience as well, which is where, where actually simulations and, and games come from as an idea. So uh, the data visualization tools like Google Earth uh, as everyone understands by now, they are embedded in specific political economic frameworks and they kind of comprise visual systems which are invented and delivered uh, by the post-Cold War, largely Western uh, military state uh, corporate apparatuses, which basically it eventually means that we are dealing with an innocent seeming or, or neutral seeming picture that is in fact a techno-scientific militarized, uh, quote unquote, objective image. And that is a standard critique that we can level against uh, any kind of data visualization uh, that, that we're dealing with. Um, but, you know, be that as it may, I think the problem of imaging the world of the Anthropocene remains. And this is not a, a simple uh, kind of problem of, of critique, I think. And this is maybe one of the motivations for, for this project is to, to kind of, um, go beyond a critical approach that that tries to build its argument from uh, within the technical apparatus, but, but maybe it kind of to add a little bit of other ways of seeing in the mix. Um, and I think here what we can uh, basically understand from this quote by TJ Demos is that the, the, one of the major problems we're dealing with today when we talk about the Anthropocene is the uh, crisis of representation. And that I, I take this to obviously to mean representation in many different uh, ways, not only visual representation, but also political and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm interested in how that becomes part of the, the conversation as well. Um, so games are important in this context. And even though it might seem when you see something like this, right, it might seem a little bit uh, unserious, which of course games, uh, that's what makes games so amazing because they are unserious, but also very, very serious, right? <laughs> so uh, when you see something like this, what is incredible about, about this is that games actually tackle this problem of uh, legibility and representation quite, quite literally, right? They do not rely on metaphor and they do not rely on, on kind of uh, positioning and, and they, they don't have to be part of a discourse right they, they are they are kind of technical formats that go into the world and where, whereby you can enter into a model space which you have to understand on many different levels if you want to participate in the game right so games like civilization um, and uh, games like stellaris which is this kind of incredibly vast simulation of the entire universe with cultures and histories and uh, you know armies and so forth but what, what my interest here was just to figure out what we can learn and how, how to take this commitment to literal uh, participation uh, further, right? So not, not to stay on the surface and to, to kind of talk in metaphorical images about the world, but to try and actually intervene into, into the model space and, and be able to understand the complexity of the system. And this is what games can do. They can 
represent all these different kinds of invented fictions, um, but go beyond the fiction because they are actually, um, you can test the outcomes of your actions, right? This is very important. And one of the major, I think, drivers from, from my thinking about this is that games are not fictions, or we could say simulations are not fictions. They go one step beyond into this idea of uh, testable uh, outcomes and uh, almost like empirical uh, uh, outcomes, right? So, so uh, I mean, just for this project, it's it's this project is uh, one of the projects I'm working on uh, that has to do with with games. But in this case, I was I was interested in the representations of complexity <clears throat> and kind of <clears throat> and kind of uh, uh, ways of layering data and ways of kind of understanding data for the observer uh, that these games are fantastic at that kind of organizing. And then another set of, of um, references came from, from this uh, really fantastic series of projects by MVRDB from the early 2000s uh, called Space Fighter. And there, there are many, many different parts of this work. And this is uh, basically a series of, of um, software applications, right? Which are, each of them have, have this uh, role to play in like a global idea of, uh, of the simulation. And I think, um, I think MVRDB in this case, they were so, far, I would say ahead of their time, I'm thinking about platforms, thinking about different ways of um, actually modeling systems and, and, and kind of testing outcomes and seeing what, what comes out and what, what can be actually changed through the systemic thinking. Um, the representations on the visual level here are very kind of you know, abstract and they deal with this idea of the uh, voxel grid and so forth. But nevertheless, I, I find this, these projects uh, quite uh, important in their capacity to to kind of at the, at the same time generate complexity while being able to kind of offer an explainability of that complexity which is unprecedented and this is where, where this uh, i think the um it's there is a similarity i think between the games uh, and also i mean in the space fighter in this whole era of MVRDB, they are calling all of these software games, which is, uh, I think it's a very significant uh, idea. So they were also able to kind of, you know, propose different, uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, kind of outcomes, talking about this kind of three-dimensional city and, um, you know, uh, basically modeling an entire fictionalized uh, kind of massive city uh, inside a cube, which is a very Dutch thing to do, I guess. But uh, in this case, it's also tied to this idea of uh, uh, basically modeling systems, and then the outcomes become uh, kind of you know you can you can trace them back, you can understand the, the history uh, if you understand the system. So there there is a lot of this. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic if you if you look into this uh, work as well. Uh, one other thing that I'm interested in here too was, was how do you think about modeling? How do you zoom out of that uh, just designer approach and how do you think about different kinds of models that you have to deal with? So not only the model of the city, but the, let's say the mental models of the players and which, which is a, another conversation we can have uh, uh, when we talk about models is the player enters into the arena or enters into the world and they have a preconceived model that gets adjusted by the parameters and by the kind of the open-endedness of the game. And basically the, you know, from a game designer standpoint, the idea is to kind of uh, manage these two loops, uh, the game loop and the kind of the observer or let's say the player uh, loop. And I think that's where, the, where a lot of complexity also arises for, for thinking about how do you actually represent uh, these kind of systems. And these are some, some other uh, examples from MVRDV, really, really uh, in-depth studies of how to model something. And then basically, eventually in this book, they, they combine them all into this like suite of software they call the um, uh, yeah, Space Fighter, right? Which is kind of an interesting um, name too, which kind of, you know, betrays a little bit of the gaming origin of that of that approach. And speaking about that, I mean, this is all very much inspired by, by one person who is uh, called Will Wright, who is an original designer by, of SimCity and The Sims and Spore. And I think Will Wright is one of the, you know, one of the really, truly 
original um, minds in, in design, in design period, not only game design, uh, because he was able to kind of understand and, and put forward certain models uh, and, and kind of, you know, which now seem obvious and they now seem kind of easy, but they were everything but uh, at that time. And these three games are very uh, super well known. And I think we can, we can also go into the detail around that. But the game I was looking into the most is called Sim Earth, which is a less well-known game from early 90s, which is a, you know, a game of where, whereby the player is uh, modeling an entire planet, right? So it's kind of a, it has this fantastic uh, graphics that you can see here, super high resolution uh, for, for that time, right? Uh, but what is what is amazing about this game is that it was done in collaboration with uh, James Lovelock. He's uh, he's a co-author of the game, so it's not only uh, uh, thinking about uh, this from the point of view of computer science, but it's also thinking about this from the point of view of environmental science. And uh, they Will Wright and, and James Lovelock they kind of work together to produce this uh, this game uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, the Gaia hypothesis is kind of the, one of the main parts of this, uh, the story that you, that you can, can uh, kind of go through. And you have, the game actually, is, this is how it looks like. It has this really fantastic, uh, colorful interface, mm. right? With, with the... Uh, sorry, someone is speaking. No worries. So, okay, so it has this amazing interface and you can see here the lower right corner, the Gaia window that the earth tells you if it's happy or sad and stuff like that, which I find kind of endearing at this point. I mean, you know, it's almost like an emoji for, for the planet earth that responds to the conditions created in the simulation. Uh, I like that a lot. I think it's quite, quite uh, interesting. And, you know, the game is quite deep. Uh, you know, it talks about civilizations and, and different uh, ideas of energy and different ideas of, uh, you know, uh, histories and evolution. And, and uh, you can simulate all of that and you can see how your scenario, how the conditions that you set for this game, how it plays out over, over eons of time. And what you end up with becomes kind of a, uh, you know, your, your planet in a way. And I, I find that fantastic also because it's an open-ended kind of game, which is when, when I'm talking about games in this case, I'm talking about an open-ended idea of the game, not, not, not a game as a, as a, you know, game of chess where you can win. These games, in this case, they're not, they don't have a win state. They just have a kind of an endless um, a kind of, you know, opening of, of new possibilities, right? Another fascinating thing about this game is that it's only 1.2 megabytes of high density uh, or whatever, high density disk. And I love that also, right? You can put the whole simulation of a planet on this like small um, uh, floppy or this uh, 5.25 inch disk on the left side, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, and another fascinating thing is the, the manual, which is something that games did in the 90s, they come with this amazing box and you open a box and there is a 300 page manual inside, right? So this one is called The Living Planet and um, it's awesome. Like you have everything inside. You have an introduction by James Lovelock, how to think about the future of the planet. Then you have a discussion on, on like, what is what are toys? What are simulations? What are the biases of the simulation? What are the uh, basically, you know, things that you cannot do here and what are the different kind of assumptions that are being made by the model and so forth. And I find this just incredible that someone took their time to really, to not only, you know, release a commercial product, but to kind of have this like ambition to, to, to educate people, right? Which is, I think, one of the big parts of this. And then you know, there is also obviously an introduction of how to play uh, and how to, you know, how to, uh, just be in that world. And then the last 50 pages are this like introduction to earth science, like a very serious collection of, of uh, the, you know, things that you need to know about the earth and how, how to think about it from that point of view. And I just find this quite incredible. But all of this, and, and I played this game and I kind of went really deep into it. And, but all of this didn't tell me like how to actually model something like that, right? How do you model something like this? And that's a question. And 
there is at the end of the manual, there is this kind of uh, diagram, which, um, which I mean, I didn't know much about this before. And then I kind of like try to understand what they're trying to do here, which is, uh, which is uh, there is a, then a whole other history, which is also related to, to, to SimCity and um, the, the fact that SimCity was based on a book um, from the 60s uh, called uh, Urban Dynamics by uh, Jay Forrester, who was kind of a fantastically influential computer engineer and system scientist. Um, he was a, uh, credited as the founding father of system dynamics, which is basically the discipline that uh, is behind this kind of modeling. And um, he, in his work, he started from modeling corporate supply chains and then went into modeling cities by describing these internal forces that control the balance of population, housing, industry, within the urban area, and so forth. And then basically, he, in this book, he was able to describe the workings of a city with 150 equations and 200 parameters. That was kind of the, the idea at that time. And the book is extremely controversial and its legacy is controversial also because of SimCity, which has been criticized on many different levels um, of actually kind of reinforcing anti-welfare politics, reinforcing the neoliberal regime and so forth. Uh, but I'm, I'm just fascinated by this idea of how to model something so deep. And this is one of uh, Forrester's models called World 2, which is the basic of kind of all subsequent modelings that uh, predict the collapse of the uh, social, technological, natural systems by the middle 21st century. And, um, but it's, it's quite, quite a fascinating uh, story. And basically it kind of, it, it does offer a tangible way to, to model something to actually put things into motion and to start modeling things. So th this model uh, was then uh, further developed in this, in this book uh, uh, called The Limits to Growth. And uh, basically the, this book was based on world three, which is the next iteration of the same model. And then the whole discipline kind of went into other, uh, or was expanded in many different ways, especially in this book, uh, Thinking in Systems, which I, recommend uh, to, to my students and to everyone, obviously. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that there many of you know this already, but on the right side, you can see also the, the kind of the model, uh, the idea of modeling as, as I was, was coming to a realization that, that might answer some of the questions I had at the beginning, which is starting from events, kind of patterns, systems, and then going into mental models and which, which directly speak to, to this idea of, of bias and, and assumption and kind of what we expect versus what, what might be actually there. Um, and just the other, just to, to finish with this precedent kind of idea, and I mean, the other thing is just uh, uh, really understanding the, the thinking of Will Wright from, from his fantastic talk in GDC 2003, which is almost 20 years now, uh, which is his, his kind of idea of how to use emergence to model larger possibility spaces with simpler components. And I, a lot of the, the kind of the mental heavy work that uh, was needed to understand all of this is kind of already uh, in this talk, uh, which is quite amazing just to think that uh, one can understand something like that and uh, be able to kind of not only ex not explain, but kind of Put it into the world and, and have effect uh, in the world. So the, the project, I mean, that, that, that I'm going to just show you today is, is very much based on all this research, right? It's, it's kind of, we're trying to uh, work with these different kinds of modeling to produce like a total, total model of, uh, of uh, urban environment of the future. And on the other hand, we also, we have another kind of leg of this research, which, which has to do with just collecting data and uh, kind of understanding contemporary conditions uh, in energy and what happens with, with different kinds of new energy systems and then what, what, you know, what is the new idea of uh, basically water and uh, agriculture, and, you know, things like precision agriculture, robots, all that stuff is kind of behind the scenes uh, of the model that we are uh, implementing right now. So there is, there is, uh, a few hundred pages of that kind of research that we did. But eventually what we, what we have come up also is the kind of a global diagram, which is a work in progress uh, very much. And it's, it's kind of a series of these 
diagrammatic representations of a possible urban uh, agglomeration of the future that for 10 billion people and uh, they, the kind of the extrapolation of what it might mean to, to do something like that under, under the conditions of the project that I showed you before. So, so we, we then ended up with, with a lot of these kind of tables that we are st still trying to kind of understand how they will feed into uh, the model. But um, the project actually started uh, by, by making a small kind of prototype, which is I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you until the end. Uh, it's a small prototype of, uh, called Planet Garden that is kind of a small scale playable ecosystem. Um, and, um, and I think just to, to kind of go back to this idea of architecture, uh, being able to tackle complex phenomena through modeling um, and through simulations, I think this is one of the, again, a driving force behind this, this work. Uh, so this was kind of an early game loop of the, of the Planet Garden, which the idea of Planet Garden is to um, basically established a, a game, right? To establish a game that has to do with, with kind of terraforming a desert site um, with, uh, with the use of these kind of tokenized uh, blocks, which basically represent different kinds of energy and different kinds of uh, environmental conditions that you can place into the world as a player. And then uh, the goal of the game is to kind of establish uh, the environmental loop uh, that is self-sustaining, which uh, was was based on on kind of um, you know I mean it's, it's based on everything that I, I show you so far but it's also based on this idea that you as a player should be able to understand what is happening uh, at any one point in the game right so we created a, a multi-scalar uh, interactive playable model of a self-sustaining wind and solar powered uh, robotic garden and the simulation was kind of uh, envisioned as kind of a reverse city builder where the goal is of the game is not to, to kind of build a city but to terraform a desert landscape by deploying different kinds of energy blocks uh, until we have the right conditions to to plant and produce oxygen so here in this very very focused uh, idea the, the aim was to learn just to enter into systems thinking and dynamic uh, uh, idea and to kind of explore how to utilize game workflows as ways to address urban issues. Um, and as you can imagine, this all of this has been also um, uh, technically just a challenge, right? To kind of really make that and make it work uh, for, in many different ways. So it's, it's fascinating how many decisions have to be made uh, on a conceptual level and through these different kinds of models, like mental models, um, you know, addressing different kinds of biases and then addressing different kind of uh, mathematical ideas and then going into the code part. Um, so we also made a manual, right? That was like one of the big things we wanted to do to kind of, you know, kind of contribute to the explainability of the whole idea. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so can he see here, the manual was also trying to not only explain the game itself, but to explain the uh, many of the ideas behind the game. So how the game is structured on an abstract level and then how the game is structured for the player, which is a different idea, uh, right? The game designer has a different idea than a player and so forth. Uh, so this is kind of a late game uh, idea. And you can see that we have a lot of different aspects here. We have also environmental overlays which kind of contribute to the whole simulation. And we also have things like solar time, which uh, basically the time is, a, is an extremely important component uh, that affects everything. So it, everything is kind of connected and, and uh, things are just uh, you know, working on that level as well. And here are some screenshots, which is fantastic also to see how the students are thinking about this in different ways and then how, how Different, different people have different ideas of what this might uh, be and how it might work actually. And I'm always, it's always fascinating to see that. Uh, different gardens, different outcomes, and different systems. So, and just to show you, there is uh, in, in version two that I did in the fall in the architectural technologies program at SciArc, there is also another 
like there is an added component to the small system, which is the carbon. Now we included kind of carbon scrubbing as part of the, the whole idea. Uh, but uh, as you see, this is a very small, like a zoom in level. Uh, but as you also have seen from, from Jay Forrester's work, it doesn't take too much to model something of that scale, right? Which of course, I mean, with contemporary thinking, and this is the thinking from the sixties, and we are all uh, fully aware of that. But with contemporary thinking, there, there will be an added idea that we are working on right now, which with uh, you know, adding machine learning and kind of thinking about different ways to expand, uh, getting into like non-deterministic uh, thinking and so forth. But uh, yeah, so this is just a version two play recording and some screenshots, different aspects. And uh, I just wanna, shout out to my to to the teams in both uh, versions it's a fantastic collection of students that are just uh, incredibly uh, yeah it's amazing just to see how uh, everything that they were able to do and then the last just thing i want to say is i have this website called worldmaking.xyz which is uh, which i started when i started this project to kind of try and collect and connect all of this uh, work and it has since expanded into other uh, trajectories uh, which you know but it's it's if you want if you go there you, you'll find a lot of that uh, uh, basically a lot of knowledge that i have acquired and generated and there is a lot of it's all connected right you can you can go between these concepts and try to uh, and understand what what is happening right here great thank you Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you everybody. That was incredible. Um, I think my head is filled and spinning with a lot of excitement and uh, curiosity and questions. And I imagine the audience also uh, must be curious. So before we, we kind of, let's say, officially turn it over to the audience, of course, if at any point in time there are questions, please feel free to make use of the chat and then we can always jump back to that at any point in time. Um, so uh, I, I guess one of the sort of connection points that felt that was resonating across all the um, presentations were, were some of these keywords that kept kind of popping up. It felt like this notion of black boxing, transparency, um, participation, autonomy, and questions of value. Um, and at the same time, one of the thoughts that kept crossing uh, my mind was related to this idea of policy, um, politics, and sort of when does participation versus um, a sort of control system or authority, uh, how, how, when, when is participation what are the limits of participation, I guess, and what are the, what are, when is it a not such a great idea to have sort of everybody informed or everybody everybody with an equal say because I think um, a lot of times these systems are sort of um, because as we saw I guess right the, the, there is bias encoded in systems and then when everything is sort of opened up um, there's also bias in people right so it's sort of a, a kind of curiosity of where, where do those limitations exist I guess from your experience or from your research or what are some of the questions surrounding those words. Um, and we could really do this, I think, in a sort of face to face sort of uh, environment. So just feel free to unmute your microphone so you can kind of spontaneously jump in if you want to. Uh, I don't think we need to be too polite just to get the ball rolling. Hi, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just mention one thing briefly. I mean, I think this question of sort of like politics and economics in relationship to design projects is, is really interesting. And I don't have a, a sort of like opinion necessarily to share, but one of the things that was revealing for us in developing this project was the extent to which thinking about the institution had to reciprocally inform uh, our am ambitions in terms of the design, even at the level of, uh, even if the, at the level of visualization. So, uh, there's this notion of choice architecture, which I think is closely related to a lot of uh, kind of like world gaming ideas, which uh, is 
you know, it's it's funny because I think a lot of the a lot of projects that were con confronting sort of like global or systemic challenges in, in the '60s. I mean, like like Buckminster Fuller's World Game or like Yona Friedman, Yona Friedman's work we're thinking about choice architecture almost as a predecessor to architecture proper. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where, where that leaves us as designers, but I think the notion of choice architecture is something that, that can no longer be sort of like conveniently left, left at the side of design. I think it's something that has to be engaged and sort of critically uh, examined and sort of, um, uh, you know, taken on to various degrees. I mean, you don't have to take, take on the project entirely, but it can't be something that's uh, that's entirely uh, entirely absent because because the, these proposals will induce a kind of choice architecture whether whether we realize it or not. I think um, just to throw a couple of words out here. The, um, the 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 concept of participation I think is a um, it, it's interesting in, in in all of these projects and I think one of the things that you know just to could talk a little bit about what Marant and I were um, discussing and, and, and trying to get to is this idea of um, thinking of design as a way to uh, promote multiple kind of multiple agencies across species, across communities, across um, environmental processes. Um, and in some ways that the, the notion of trying to set up participation already implies that there's something in control and, 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 and there's an allowance that's being made to, to something else to, to come in. And, um, and part of this is trying to frame a kind of set of methodologies that might begin to um, not necessarily flatten, um, uh, you know, kind of inputs into the system, but instead, you know, uh, allow for the promotion of uh, kind of mul you know, multiple agents um, simultaneously. And I think that's, I think in that there's a there's an idea then that it's not um, uh, an allowance of participation, but instead it's it's a design ethos that begins to think uh, across you know across that range, um, and it also then um, begins to take on an idea that we may you know that in, in some ways that we're all uh, kind of acting and reacting as opposed to kind of planning you know stepwise what what that future begins to look like. Um, it's a bit all over the place, but just to kind of put those points in there. No, I think I think that's that's. That's great, Brad. I mean, like th I, this this concept of participation. I think it it's like feels very political. It's like very much about rights and and e equality. It's sort of like a liberal humanist framework, um, you know, which has incredible goals for for us politically, <laughs> um, but. But like climatically, in terms of landscape, in terms of complex systems, like things don't just things just don't work that way, right? Like we see that all the time. Um, like for example, island nations bearing uh, uh, the brunt of what climate is doing. For example, right? Like it, it climate doesn't divide equally. <laughs> um, so I think this question of of equal participation is really interesting, and it. And Brad brings up a really great point about like, how do you then reframe participation somehow? Um, you know, what is like, uh, like blind, multiple, like naked participation look like with with things at their scales? Um, and I think that's something that a, that that a lot of these talks kind of spoke to is like, how do you really like figure out what what the size and shape of a thing is um, in all these different ways? I think there's another another related concept of delegation. I have to say, like DAOs give me panic attacks because I feel like so much like choice anxiety and the fact that you know I I don't want to participate in those kinds of things. I want to sort of like delegate my participation or sort of like abscond from that participation. So I think there are those kinds of kinds of situa situations as well. There's a sort of like spectrum of engagement which um, which I think needs to be uh, needs to be accounted for. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, the DAOs, I, I'm thinking about like, I need my own DAO before I can plug into another one, right? I need to kind of figure out my own thing, <laughs> my own thinking first, which is also like extremely, you know, uh, like uh, just distributed as well. Sometimes you, you have different ideas from different points of view. But just to speak a little bit to this idea of participation, I, I think, I feel like that's, I mean, in my thinking, that's tied to, to the problem of agency, which 
which has to do with, I mean, how we frame the entry point into design for, and this is something I'm thinking a lot about since I'm also working with students. And uh, in, my, in my kind of framework, the, the player and the student, that kind of has, a, there is a similarity between these two sets of, of people. And I, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear if, if anyone else has this idea of like what, how do we go even more literal into systems and how do we not remain on the outside, which is, I, I guess when I say on the outside, I mean, it's the, the domain of, of critical thinking and, and presenting argument uh, that is not at its core, I mean, tied to modeling, really. It's, it's tied to, to the idea of explainability and, and producing a critical argument that sometimes just ends up in the, you know, in the academic context. And, and I think uh, that has to do with agency, I think, in my case. So how do you, how do you infuse agency into a, a work that then produces this idea of participation? And maybe the blockchain is a prime, obviously, uh, right? It's an idea, but I mean, right? Some people are very critical of that too. So well, you have to be critical of everything on all levels, but that doesn't mean that you can't actually go on to the level of actually building a DAO. Um, when we started designing design DAOs, we had the same fear of, of, of like Andrew had on, oh, I'm gonna be have to be there to kind of decide everything, right? But that's not the case, right? So you can delegate your decision. You can come and go. And the interesting bit is that you can build the, the software protocol, but if there are no agents around to actually use it, it just becomes a dead thing and then you move on to the next model. And maybe that's the kind of case, right? You presented you know, a series of models and it's, I don't think we're ever gonna have like the model for participation. Maybe it's a case of we built one, it works now. You know, it doesn't work in five years. You know, we abandon it and built another one. Uh, but I think the, the the crucial bit here is that for the first time uh, in ages, we kind of have a choice on designing an economy around what we want to build. Uh, and it doesn't come with, okay, you have to accept the present state of the economy and it's take it or leave it, right? So you can design um, questions around peer-to-peer -peer economies, questions around participation and, and, and who is the stakeholder. I think the, the most difficult part is actually designing nature as an agent in all of this. And uh, how do you give voice to that? So I don't, I don't have an answer, but you know, it's an interesting question. Yeah, sorry. I, oh. oh, please, I, please you go ahead. I was just thinking about, uh, actually it's interesting you talk about Mississippi River and how basically that river's management has affected nature in quite a dramatic way um, and a negative one. Um, and then also with, um, who was it, uh, Bradley, uh, talking about um, the starfish uh, and the coral reefs and the agricultural runoff. Um, and I suppose, uh, I guess, talking about nature, I know th throughout this entire thing, I couldn't get the idea of, you know, playing God out of my head, especially with the genetic modifying of um of these you know species i guess i don't know the issues stem from human intervention and i guess um you know the the agricultural runoff in australia for example you're taking the uh the route and i'm not disputing the whole submarine thing that's pretty cool um i guess i'm questioning the morality of uh taking another bold stance of saying, trying to patch the symptom rather than the issue itself, which is the agricultural industry um, caused by humans, I suppose. I guess that's something that I would, um, yeah, voice kind of thing. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think part of this, you know, um, I, I guess I am somewhat disputing the, the kind of the idea that we need to create drones to to murder starfish because you know because we've um, you know because of another set of actions that we've taken. So so I'm you know I think it's it, I, it is it is a bit um, you know it, it's trying to show the irony of of all of it right that we're we're investing in all of these kind of technologies to manage the earth because we've are, because we've we've reordered it, and so in that I think part of this is. Um, 
you know, you're, you're exactly right. Like, where do we, where do we go back to remediate? And this is kind of the issue is that we're, we're constantly trying to find ways to solve issue, solve problems that, um, that have kind of an infinite set of roots um, to them. And so it's, it's, it's in my, in my mind. And I think what we're trying to get at is it's, it's important to project forward um, as, as opposed to, to begin to kind of ameliorate some, some previous condition and to kind of continually think about what, it, wh where we're going as opposed to um, how we're how are reordering the, the, the past basically right so so there's a um, uh, uh, that that relationship then gets shifted right that, that we're not that we're not looking at some sort of idealized condition for the planets um, or even the climate but instead we're we're using kind of our, our tools and technologies to imagine how we how we construct an environment that we want to live in in the future and and that's one that I you know I think we're trying to propose is one that really um, highlights kind of this kind of multi-agent set of rela relationships, right? As opposed to, yeah. sorry, as opposed to an, um, a world that's ordered for kind of human comfort and safety, which is kind of what where we've been for the last, you know, you know thousands of years. Right? And I, I think that is like a sort of ethical position about the way that we think about the future is, is central. Um, but to, to kind of speak, a little bit more specifically, James, to your your question about remediation. I think remediation is like a really big part of of uh, of you know a climatic project. But there is absolutely no way we can go. We can just go back and change agricultural runoff, and then everything is fine, right? There's like a there's an ecology that's been set into motion that like is now doing its own thing. It won't just kind of die off because it's um, the the cause was you know that the the one of the heads of the hydra is cut off. As Brad was saying, it sort of like becomes a whole new thing, and it and it uh, has now created an ecology that that sustains itself in new ways, that has new relationships, that you know because the starfish are eating the. The um, what are they called? The little things. Um, what say again, Brad? I just said coral. <laughs> yeah. You know, it it completely it completely changes like the way that those populations work there. So like all of the population relationships that happen in that ecology are completely ruined. And so what you get in a lot of these cases when people are trying to do really good things is that they'll sort of fix a problem, um, which then leads to a complete and 100% dead zone, right? That's like, it, there's there's nothing to kickstart it, right? Without something like, and, and I, I can't speak to the necessary, um, to the COTSPOT more specifically, but uh, introducing new predators, introducing these kind of new agents, um, kickstart something, you know, rather than attempts to, to, to take us back in time, which is impossible. Um. Yeah. yeah, I think this, I think this is an amazing point because I, I think about the Aral Sea, for example, I mean, it's completely desolate. There's basically nothing there. If we were to talk about remediating that environment, it would have to be done artificially. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting point. I think there's a whole spectrum of things between sort of, um, uh, I don't know, the worst case scenario of genetic intervention and these kinds of these kinds of spaces, which which if if they need to, if they're going to be regreened, they have to be reseeded, I guess. Uh, Catherine, you wanted to say something. Oh, uh, yeah, um, I, the conversation has gone a little bit more in a different direction, but um, I, I don't know, maybe I was just connecting. Um, some of the ideas around simulation that we were talking about earlier um, and thinking about how um, simulation seems to, I think, be a, some, somewhat of a, a new medium for, for designers and critical thinkers um, and how that it's not necessarily just a digital medium, but I also see it in kind of large scale, physical, um, interactive, spatial, kind of dynamics and even things like role playing. Um, and so I think it's an interesting space, whether it's kind of rooted in a game engine as a kind of, um, or 
in a digital simulation, but um, sort of the idea of a simulation for sort of an imagining um, and speculating on new futures or um, testing out like some of the things that are very difficult to pin down about um, different combinations like political economies. So when I think about a lot, some of the game references that say Damian put forward, I, it, or I also think about um, some of the work that like legal scholars have done in relation to kind of simulating economic, political economic dynamics that um, don't exist yet, but see what could not, not as things that we literally want to test out, but as kind of ways of just simulation as a way of thinking through new critical dynamics. Um, and I don't really know if that has a relationship to like the natural world. Um, no, I, I, I think that's a fantastic point, uh, Catherine. I, this is my, one of the things that I'm struggling with a lot is like, how do you know what you're working on as a designer, <laughs> right? Which is this, this question of, of policy and, and uh, and you know, establishing new protocols is it's it's really an appealing question, but uh, there is a there is a, another question there, which is to which extent does that uh, respond to the expertise of, of, of an architectural uh, discipline that we already have, which is tied to this idea of historically speaking drawing, uh, right, and kind of understanding the world through drawing practices that ha that has that have their own capacity to usher in new realities through their own means, let's say, which I, to, to me, that's tied to the problem of representation that we're talking about. So representation, not so much uh, as, as thinking about, you know, the parliament space, the parliament of species, the parliament of things, and, and everyone gets, gets to say, you know, but the representation of how do we, as designers, you know, instantiate new images of the world so that it becomes operational again. And I think that's where the simulation comes as a new, as a form, not, not a new format, but as a format, as a possible format, not the only format. And I think just to, just to compare it to something historical, I think the, the question of the collage, for example, which whether you like it or not, a lot of the representations of nature that have the ambition to represent and also explain, they rely on this question of the collage. Right. And this is never addressed. This is kind of, a, oh, you know, it's something something that we just take for granted. But, you know, collage, I mean, as, as a format has its own historical grounding in the early 20th century culture and, and the world of that time. And it made sense to kind of invent a new format of visuality, of, of visual thinking that, that operates like that, right? So my, my only point here is like, I think the reflection of, on that, uh, I mean, what kind of the response to that problem is is tied to this question of the simulation. So not, not so much about the mathematics of it and, and the behind the scenes, but really the visuals and the way that you can communicate and, uh, you know, kind of go, go beyond that, that cozy line of architectural representation that we kind of are familiar with, but maybe that has lost its agency. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Actually, um, for issue two, that's going to be published on Friday. Um, Mario Carpo contributed a piece exactly on collage, but also on postmodernism and Renaissance and how the two historical moments are both uh, citationists in, in that it's always pointing to copies of a copies of a copy. I'm actually just mindful of time that we're supposed to end now, but I think the conversation is going so great. We would like to open this up uh, to the rest of the floor. So I know that some guests have to leave. But uh, others, you're welcome to stay and continue the conversation. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. I apologize. I have to, I have to head out for another event. Bye. I also need to jet, but really fantastic. So many inspiring things to see and talk about. Thank you. Yeah, I also need to leave now for a studio review, but um, it was a really great experience. And I look, look forward to being in touch more. Yeah, me too. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. For <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. I'm so sorry. I ended everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. That's all right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess maybe, um, yeah, thanks, everybody, for, <laughs> for coming today. Um, if there is a last question, there are two more guests who've seen 
like they have a second. Yeah. <laughs> we have a large DAO community but, here. But of course, if there are no 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 further questions, then we're happy to let you guys get on with your day. Because um, yeah, some of it, I mean, Theo, you still have an evening, and Damien, you still have a full day ahead of you. So. <laughs> right. All right. See you guys. <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> that was it. I think I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay for the drinks at the pub. That is uh, or, uh, more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I'm Great. gonna stay for there. If there's anyone uh, having any questions, uh, maybe any of the students. Um, Damien, that was fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I'll probably ping you an email on how you could really put tokens on the games. That's that's great. That's a fantastic. <laughs> and and there is real economy involved in there. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, awesome. Yeah. Albert, I thought you wanted to ask uh, some questions. Is he still here? Oh, no, no, no worries. It's, it was a great conversation. I think the flow was fantastic. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll send them by email. Uh, that was great. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. All right. Well, I guess I um, guess for that then. Um, oh, I kind of. Sorry, I, I mean, if people don't mind, I, I did have so, a question for, well, I guess just a statement, I guess kind of like what I thought of, I'd, I guess, um, I don't know, because my friend, he keeps on going on about blockchain to me, and I mean, I haven't <laughs> really um, looked at it, but he, he says like, yeah, it's very good in terms of like, I don't know, he, he sees it as having the potential to, um, yeah, I don't know, be a really good uh potentially ethical like way uh forward with the economy kind of thing and i think i don't know it goes back to because when you assign a true i know you have the the sort of uh the token uh of the thing itself and you assign a value to that um which is you know dated and categorized i suppose you create a a physical interpretation of the real thing close to how a traditional bartering system like occurs when monetary value is assigned to uh, physical thing and uh, physical things and I suppose not um, more ethereal things um, as kind of you know because as soon as you bring sort of labor into those uh, questions then value becomes uh, questionable and unobjectified yeah anyway sorry I have to apologize on all levels. I mean, um, oh, I can't hear you. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. Um, yeah, so it, it looks like a bartering system, but it's not, right? So the main idea is that um, the motivation behind creating blockchain in Bitcoin was the failure of the banks, the massive, massive, massive failure of central institutions, right? Yeah. Um, being Greek myself, right, I've experienced a, a failed economy and capital controls both from the side of China, where I was when Greece failed, and Greece at the same time. Um, so I've experienced the, the kind of idea of needing to leave China and taking my money with me and not being able to do so, right, because I had to kind of take it out of China and put it in Greece, right, so it's a no-no on both situations. Um, but joking aside, right, the I think the true um, discussion here is is to discuss essentially how do you how do you go into the process of saying well this is valuable, right? And 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 doing that for things that are um, maybe not of a monetary value. And I think that's the the kind of key thing here. Uh, and crypto economics, while a lot of people believe that only has to deal with kind of going with this kind of neoliberal approach to say well we'll monetize everything and tokenize everything. Crypto economics actually works on a level where you can have, you can assign value and, and barter with value that doesn't have a monetary uh, um, utility. So it might have other utilities like participation. It might have an utility of an archive, right? So, and I think that's the interesting bit here. The other thing is that um, the 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 myth of the economy working as a kind of a uh, natural organism that you cannot actually uh, play with is a myth, right? You, you know, economists design economies. And I think once you realize as an, as an architect, it becomes a much more powerful 
discussion when you are uh, trying to set up, for example, a project with a circular economy, right? Whether this is like a game like Damien is doing, right? Or whether this is in an actual project, right? I don't see why we would not go on to an actual project and, and you know, use a game engine as a simulation and say, here's how, you might, how it might work. So a lot of things we're trying to do with blockchain is actually uh, showcase a much more, um, I don't want to say participatory because you know, design has a, a, a kind of the kind of idea of participatory design from the 60s, but a much more peer-to-peer -peer way of uh, doing things. Whether that's better or worse, uh, we can discuss that, right? But I think um, we're kind of sifting into a more collective way of understanding the world and operating in the world. And maybe that... Um, Kind of technology might give us the answer instead of just relying on you know automation from the point of view of algorithms or machine learning actually now you you mentioned you a greek um i think the greek financing situation and the dow in 2016 they failed partly because of very similar reasons right it's because of the attention economy so mm -hmm. in the Dow 2016, they voted for a scam. <laughs> and in the Greek financial crisis, they voted for something which ended up perhaps is not the best option. You know, well, it, they, it, it was the same problem all over. Well, they probably they, they kept on voting for scams for 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 20 years. So that that's what that brought us into into that uh, whole, whole conversation. But yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting. Um, Whenever Bitcoin's energy um, uh, issue kind of gets into the news, it's always a failed economy. They, you know, they never say like it's half the economy of Switzerland or the United States or the United Kingdom. Right? They go with something that is always, always over, over easy to criticize. Actually, the interesting thing is that the first time I heard about blockchain, it was 2017, and. The guy sat next to me and then he asked me, have you heard of blockchain? And that guy is actually Damien. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but I remember that so vividly. Well, that was the, the time, right? Like it's a new thing. So uh, relatively yeah. speaking, right? Uh, but I mean, it's super fascinating to you what, what you are doing. I mean, it's the, the whole idea of, of you know, connecting software uh, and kind of inventing new ways of, of modeling that has mm -hmm. that have to do with participation. Uh, like I, I was thinking about that from a totally different point of view that has to do with, with games and that has to do with, um, you know, kind of preserving maybe a, an idea of agency that is, yeah. that is historical. It has to do with like pictorialist understanding of architectural like uh, history in a way. But I think... What, what you're pointing to in this idea of, of kind of deep systems that can actually organize without being seen, I think that's a, yeah. that's like, that's a platform idea, which, which can then produce many, many different outcomes. And um, I, how do you think about authorship? Uh, and this is something that I, I was thinking about a lot in, in the case of my, my project with students. But when you are designing these things, you, you, you must have your own kind of agenda or, or yeah, interest. Yeah. So how do you think in this idea of designing a protocol or platform? What is it? Uh, it I, 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 I think it goes back to the idea of saying, you know, um, my, my, my background initially is on, on, on being an architect and, and kind of then designing generative systems. So you shift from designing the object to designing, you know, the algorithm that's going to be producing the object which is kind of easy if, once you get through the computational tools. Um, the, when you design a protocol then that is kind of decentralized or is supposed to be working on a decentralized manner, um, you try to design participation into it and, and um, there are many pitfalls where you can fall into this, the, the space where you go, well, then it's a server or whether it's a centralized kind of idea. So. Um, you try to kind of work out bias out of the system in a sense and, 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 and also try to make it as accessible as possible. And you know you have to realize that we're talking always about um, public and permissionless blockchains in this, right? So you might have other 
layers where there are, you know, there are permissions or the, you have to ask for, for, for control of it. And the, those kind of systems have their, their, their play uh, and uh, place as well. If you're talking, for, for example, supply chains. But I think it's, it's, it goes back to um, like your, your small diagrams. I mean, you, you were visualizing the game and then you had these kind of feedback loops in, 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 in there where you go, okay, I'm gonna try and connect this here and see, see what the result is. Um, and for us, it's a, it's a kind of uh, understanding where you, you design this feedback loops. So it kind of becomes a, its own organism in the end. Um, but also uh, the, the difficulty since 2017 was getting to the level where this is easily usable by say students, for example, right? So every time we try to do a workshop with this, we had to go like, okay, you have to install this and this and this and this, like, you know, two hours later, everybody was like, forget it. I don't want to deal with this kind of thing, right? So um, so getting to the level where it's usable and, and you can, even as a game, like reach a level where they can they can play with it is is the ambition now. Um, so I don't know if if I answered your question right, but I think it goes back to the level of yeah, designing a platform essentially, and then uh, whether then you use this to um, work towards you know desirable effects in architecture. I mean. I think the, the most difficult bit would be to try and, for example, tokenize aesthetics and say, well, I want to move towards, say, a, a DAO that produces, I don't know, Baroque buildings or, you know, Gothic buildings. Um, but then again, it might be a case where you design a protocol and someone else comes and says, oh, I want to use this for Gothic buildings or whatever they want to use it for. Actually, so the most, oh, sorry. You no, no, go for it, sorry. I, I just wanted to say that actually the most direct connection between game and blockchain for me is uh, John Nash. Like 2008 was the year that the white paper came out of Bitcoin, but it was also one of the last paper of John Nash that came out on agency's method. Uh, he was writing about game theory on non-cooperative games. So he was stimulated to think about situations where players would interact, they're not cooperating, but then the outcome is equilibrium and harmonious. And that's exactly blockchain. And then they publish in the same year. So I think blockchain is a game, but it's a rational decision maker game, which rational decision maker doesn't exist except machines. So well, there is there is also this question of like bounded rationality that that historically is tied to this idea, right? Um, and I I mean, and as especially if you mentioned like war games, and this is yeah, an interesting history too. I'm kind of fascinated by that. <laughs> like equilibrium is like a mutually assured destruction is the yeah. outcome of the, of the kind of world game you have played. Yeah. So now oh, we see yeah. that unraveling a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I w it reminded me of von Neumann because he invented game theory. He invented a uh, von Neumann architecture CPU. So it's like game theory on simulation. And then he also contributed to atomic bomb. So it's almost like yes. mutual destruction, but then from the physical level to the mathematical domain and just keep running that until uh, you cannot get better chips. Exactly. Right. It's amazing how von Neumann has had a, a, an impact on, um, on a lot of sciences and practices, right? So um, I've uh, been reading in Kofsky in the, in the past month or so about how economics became a cybernetic science and a lot of the things you mm. mentioned apply to architecture as well. Um, so a lot of things we, we try and do in, in blockchain um, don't come from game theory, but actually from cybernetics and stick emergency coordination. So some of the references you can go and check are um, the minimum viable model uh, and uh, cybersync project in Chile and all of the kind of cyberneticians essentially discussing levels of communication, information, entropy, and all of that. Cyber is such a fascinating history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, I think I'll go guys again. Uh, uh, a really long bicycle ride awaits me. Uh, that was <laughs> really fascinating. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be in touch. I mean, this, is, this has been really, 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 really exciting and uh, wonderful to participate in. Thank you very I much. I second that. Oh. Thanks, everyone. And thanks you, thank you for inviting me.
uh, Deborah Hardin and Pro. Super nice to see you guys. And thank you, Theo, for the fantastic hey. presentation and conversation. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. Hopefully this won't be our last encounter. It will be fantastic to so, have you with our research class there to yeah. send the project that the students are doing. We'll right. find a way to, yeah. to, to stay in touch, basically. Yeah. Cool. We, we still have the publication. You, you still have to hand in the written piece. You have to yeah. Yeah. So that. <laughs> <laughs> Please we, remember we, that. <laughs> we, we promise we'll do so. Don't, no, no worries. Okay. All right. Great. Deborah Hadin provided us always a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.